Hello and welcome to a very rainy San Francisco morning here at the Hackster Secret Volcano there. We're unfortunately not uh, immune to those freaks of nature. Um, but what I'm excited to talk to you about today is a virtual workshop on getting started with uh, CAD or computer aided design. So if you want to 3D print stuff, this is your first step. Well, okay. Your first step if you want to 3D print stuff, is you could go to an online resource like GrabCAD or uh, Thingiverse, where they have a bajillion free online models that you can work with. Um, I just pulled off uh, a couple of human ears with modifications that let you put microphones in them for a binaural stereo recording, which lets you make audio recordings that sound like you get you know, forward and back and up and down depth, as well as side to side. And that's something that someone just recently put up for their own use. And now they're sharing with the world. So uh, you can make all kinds of stuff with what people have already made out there. So if you're just getting started and you want to use an enclosure for something or make a robot hand, um, that's probably your best bet. But what if you want to make something more custom? Uh, for example, I've been building this little spider bot. And I'm trying to make it as personable as possible. Uh, ideally, it's going to be this perfect mix of creepy and adorable. Uh, so. I want to make my own design for that, my own enclosure. I started out with a really simple sphere, and that's what I'm going to show you how to make first. But you can also make sweet things like knuckle rings uh, and uh, you know enclosures for wearables and stuff. So I've also got this project that I'm working on, which is a belt with uh, enclosures for different types of electronics. It's going to have one for the particle internet button. It's got this battery enclosure here. And each piece has its own um, set of belt loops for sticking the belt through. Uh, as you can see, however, you've got to be careful with the dimensions on that. Because sometimes you have things just a couple millimeters off and they don't fit. So, let's see. We'll get to the measuring part in a minute. And for now, I would like to tell you about the few options you have. So if you've never done CAD before, which I'm going to assume based on the fact that you're watching this, um, there are a couple of easy ways to get started. You might have heard about the more popular advanced ones like SolidWorks, SketchUp, Maya, Rhino, etc. And uh, Blender is a very popular open source one. So when I first got started with CAD, I started with Blender. And it was really frustrating, even though it was in a workshop, because in order to get started, you had to know all these hotkeys. Um, you had to get used to these commands in order to uh, use it efficiently. And at the same time, you were trying to learn the fundamentals of how to put together a 3D model. So it didn't work that great um, for me as a beginner. And so there's a couple of other options. Uh, Tinkercad is a, one that I really like as a first step in your CAD journey. Uh, it's been acquired by Autodesk now, which is rad, because they've got about 8 million different pieces of software for it. In fact, they also own the next step up that I would consider recommending, which is Fusion 360. Um, and then also Maya, which is a really popular program for doing sort of organic forms. You'll find out that each uh, application has its own pros and cons. So a lot of people prefer SolidWorks for mechanical modeling. A lot of people prefer SketchUp for architectural models. And a lot of people prefer Maya for um, you know, organic animated forms. Uh, but of course, there's overlap. And you can use your favorite uh, CAD program for any of those applications, and you'll be just fine. So I'll show you Tinkercad and tell you a little bit about Fusion, because I think that's a great middle step. Basically, um, well, let's have a look. Screen share, infinity mode. Here's a quick tip on uh, doing screen shares with, uh, with 3D modeling. If you're doing a screen share with Fusion 360, make sure that you show your entire screen, because otherwise, the overlays and things won't show up, and people will have no idea what you're talking about. Anyway, so here's Fusion 360. Uh, it's just autodesk.com. You can Google it, whatever. Uh, Tinkercad, pretty much the easiest CAD modeling program ever. It's in your browser, so you don't have to install anything. It's completely free for everyone. And you can log in with your Autodesk ID, or if you have you know, a separate thing, then you can use that. 
Um, let's see what my password is. <laughs> As you can see, they have a challenge going. You can make a hideous sweater pattern. Fantastic. So I'm going to show you one that I made. Um, first off, let's see. I think these are two different versions of the same model. For my little spider bot, I wanted a dome of some type that would encapsulate all the electronics on the top of it, but at the same time be pretty small so as not to obstruct the legs. So as you can see, um, this little guy has uh, has a light blue beam inside it with an H bridge on it controlling the motors. And obviously this isn't super stable yet. Um, I still need to do some modifications. I need to put in an external power source because the coin cell that this runs on is only enough to power the motors for about two seconds before it runs out. Uh, you know, but it's still exciting. So what are the features that you want it to have? You want it to encapsulate all of this so it doesn't get banged about. And you want it to not restrict the motion of these. In this case, looking at what we've got here, um, there's a little lip. And in my case, I just decided to uh, make it big enough to go over that lip. And there's also, from where the robot initially had its control board, there's a little, let's see, can I rotate this? There we go. There's a little nub in here. Um, and so I wanted to make sure there was a slot left for that. And so you can see in the final design, there's that little nubbin slot showing the front of the robot and a couple of eyes. And there were going to be a couple of rabbit ears as well. However, uh, the 3D printer had some, some issues. <laughs> to be more specific, the issue is that the, uh, the roll of filament was um, loosened and then tightened in such a way that the filament overlapped itself. Uh, and so it got bound up when the printer was trying to pull from the roll. Pro tip, be careful. <laughs> so, oh yeah, so figuring out how to make this. You can use, you'll want to measure these features. And I think that working in millimeters is the best way to go pretty much all the time. Not only because metric is a much more sensible system, separate rant, but um, because it is a lot easier for me to mentally uh, divide up you know, x number of millimeters versus you know, eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch, sixteenth and thirty seconds of an inch. Millimeters are so much easier. Because it's a smaller unit, it just makes sense. Um, I think that my, oh, there we go. My calipers don't have a super bright screen. But you can see that basically you uh, you turn it on. Most digital calipers have this. A lot of better calipers will have actual measurements, tip marks along with the bottom here as well. But you can switch units between inches and millimeters. And just for funsies, I'm going to measure this little nub in here. And let's see, it's 7.4 millimeters. And if I were working in inches, that would be 0.29 inches, a third of an inch, pretty much. Like, who wants to work in? 0.29 inches, it just isn't logical. So um, you can also zero it so you can find the difference between uh, features. And at the same time, you can use the other side of the calipers to measure the space between things. So here, the space between these uh, parts on the leg assembly is half an inch or 13.1 millimeters. And uh, I, while a half inch may initially seem easier to wrap your brain around, uh, if you, after you've worked with this for a little while, you'll find that from previous projects, you'll have a pretty intuitive understanding of how big certain things are. So you'll be better able to estimate them. And of course, if that fails, if you don't have a calipers, you can just use a tape measure, like for sewing or you know a construction tape measure, whatever. As long as it's got millimeters or whatever your preferred unit is, you're good. So that, um, that's 7.5 millimeters wide. You'll also start getting an idea for what exactly you'll need to measure in order to make this thing work. So basically, the four dimensions that I need are, uh, you know, what's the width of this? What's the height of this? What's the diameter of this bit, the whole lip? 
and how tall do I want it to be, or how wide do I want the entire sphere to be in order to not obstruct these. And so let's see, this is 7.5 millimeters wide. It is about four and a half, four millimeters tall. The lip itself is about 42 millimeters. And then the height will probably end up being around 56 or 60. So what I did here was just sort of vaguely approximate, get, get an estimate of how big I thought the sphere would need to be, and then um, printed a test just to see how it would work. For me, it worked on the first time. But you know, uh, you can either do the whole geometry thing and get your, uh, your measurements super correct, or you can uh, just iterate. Obviously, a combo of both is is good because you want to bone up on your geometry skills too. So let's see. What I did was create a sphere first off. Let's go into Tinkercad and start doing this. Okay, so here are the bits from what I was making before. And you can hold control on a Mac anyway and drag this around to orbit view it. Um, you can also use these controls to shift your point of view. This um, rabbit head is currently completely grouped. And if I select it here, I can choose to ungroup it. And that shows you where I have, oh, so it ungroups one level of grouping at a time. So chronologically, what you've done. Um, in this case, oh, let's zoom out a bit. Zoom out. Cool. Um, I've got this internal sphere. And that's the hole that I told you about. I'm just going to completely mess with this, this design. Oh, yeah, you can scale things up and down. Uh, in this case, I'm not scaling it. I'm just moving it shoop, along the z-axis. Let's make it a little smaller. So z-axis is up and down. Same thing with any other CAD. Um, you know, x and y axes are these horizontal axes. So that's one level of grouping down. Let's ungroup it some more. So this is the block that I use to cut off the sphere at this point. Oh, it's just showing me that for some reason. But these are the ears, actually. So when you're in Tinkercad, there are these extras that you can use. For some reason, these are Easter-based. <laughs> Um, or just wildlife based, but yeah, you've got some fun little things that you can spice up your models with, as well as little dice, diamonds and things, um, letters and numbers, which are what you would use to create um, knuckle rings, super fun. I've got some examples of these as well and a Hexter project on that, so I'll share that. And then all these geometric shapes that you can use. So you don't have to think about how would I construct this 3D shape with a modeling program. You can just grab it. So here's the, oh, I guess in that level of grouping, I also put the little eyes in. <laughs> now here's something fun to show you. I wonder if I can control Z, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna regroup those Hmm, how could I do this? Oh, yeah. So, I'm going to ungroup them. So, I'm going to move this down. And group these objects, so the sphere and the hole of the sphere. And what happens now is that that whole one disappears. And it just appears as a single, single assembly. But what you can see is how the um, attachments are now projecting inside of the sphere. So the order in which you do things matters. Just like with math, there's an order of operations. If you want to have a hole that actually cuts through all of your things, you will need to do the whole part last. Um, very important for enclosures. Unless, I mean, if you don't care about these eyes and ears and things projecting inside your sphere, it doesn't really matter, but at the same time, 
these ears on the inside would require support material because again, you have if you put a horizontal slice through there, right where the ears are coming in, um, you'll end up with two little nubbins sort of floating in space. Um, and so just to make it easier on yourself, do all your grouping of holes last. Now, I'm going to do a simple project from scratch, just so you can see the whole process. So let's see. Design. New. I'm not going to say this one because I've done terrible, terrible things to it. They give you these fun names when you first create a new project. So let's rename this. Properties. I kind of like shiny Jocko Bruticus. But I'm gonna change it to let's see, um, tiny particle holder. The first step is always to measure everything and make notes about what the dimensions are. So I usually go ahead and make a little sketch of the thing. So here's my disk. Um, I'm gonna use all three dimensions, and so I usually. Um, do it on a side view, but yeah, maybe oh, the top view. <laughs> pretend that that looks good, and shrink to the side view. Uh, so now, what are the important dimensions here? This is the particle internet button that we looked at last week. So I need the height of the thing as a whole, and depending on how I want to interact with it, do I need to use these buttons or not? In which case, should I make it? larger than the entire thing, or should I try and make two layers that interact and allow me to push those buttons? I think for now I will make one that just encapsulates the entire thing. What I could even do is make two halves that sort of sandwich together and will push all the buttons at once, um, but I will eventually probably want um, something that allows me to manipulate them individually. So let's see. Where are my calibers? Here we go. So besides the height, we care about the diameter. And most of these dimensions are probably going to be available online. So if you don't have calipers, you can also get around it that way. Uh, and then we need the values for this little USB guy. So on most particle enclosures for this, they just have a whole slot coming out this way, which makes sense, because that's how your, your uh, USB cable plugs in. Let me show you. You not only need a space for this port, but you need space for it to be able to come out completely. Um, so those are probably going to be my dimensions. If I had anything else projecting off of this, like if I plan to plug things into the breadboard on the bottom here, that would be important to include as well. Also, you want to make sure that your um, object is going to not overheat. So if you have something that requires a heat sink or even just sort of moderate cooling, you'll want to put in vents or something like that. So let's see. Grab my calipers, turn them on, make sure we're in wonderful millimeters. And in this case, I want to include the height of the USB cable. You know what, though? I don't need to. Because I'll probably just make this whole wide slot, and then it doesn't matter how tall it is because it'll be cut out. So let's see from the bottom of the buttons to the top of the particle, including that USB thing, which is about the tallest thing on there. It's going to be about 15.7 millimeters, so about 16 millimeters. And then the diameter is Since these LEDs are wonderfully directly across from each other, I can tell this pretty well. 65.4 millimeters, round to 65.5. Then the USB thingy is about. It's about seven and a half millimeters, or more like eight. Where these little, these little metal lips come off. Although the USB cable is wider, so let's make it say 
13 millimeters. And from the edge of the disc into there is going to be about 20 millimeters. Okay. AKA two centimeters. So what we end up here it with here is you know doing 65.5 millimeters wide, 13 millimeters here, 20 millimeters here, and 16 millimeters here. Oh, okay, cool. Now we're making an enclosure, which means that it's gonna have to fit inside this thing without scraping on it. Um, what you can do is, if it's something that's pretty small and, and tolerant, you can probably just make it the same size and sand it down if that's really important to you, but really I usually just add uh, 0.5 millimeters on either side of the object, um, or up to a millimeter depending on the quality that I'm planning to print it at. Uh, so yeah, so if we add a millimeter to the diameter, we we'll get 66.5. Um, we want it to be 17 millimeters of clear space inside, probably about, um, I think I can get away with, yeah, 14 millimeters for the width here, and 21 millimeters. Although, yeah, let's leave it at 21 for depth for the USB cable. Now the other thing is that your enclosure has a thickness. So when you're creating the, original, the initial object, um, remember how I said that I used the shell feature in Fusion, um, and even in Tinkercad, you know, you usually start out with an outer sphere, and then you'll add an internal hole. So your initial thing needs to be a little bit bigger, depending on the thickness. Uh, you can usually get away with 1.5 millimeters. Um, 2 millimeters if you want it to be super durable. 0.5 if you want it to be a little bit more dainty. If you're working on small stuff, that's easy to get away with because um, you know the, the walls are close together, so there's not a lot of unsupported space. Um, let's see. So in this case, I'll probably use 1.5 millimeter thick walls. And that means that I add three millimeters onto the size of these things. So uh, that becomes 69.5. I'll probably just bump it up to 70 for fun. 70 outside diameter. And then um, that doesn't really need to change. That's the diameter. That's the dimensions for a hole. So it doesn't really have a shell thickness. Um, and then the thickness here the height of it is going to end up being probably around 20 millimeters, which is very nice and satisfying. So it'll be like 70 diameter by 20. And what I'm trying to do here is create another belt attachment that works with this. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet because it's going to be a surprise. <laughs> but it will include a light blue bean. Just show you the tangle of stuff that I've, I've made for it. Like there's going to be a central module with a light blue bean and some light. Woo! Oh dear. Some neo pixels, a speaker, and stuff like that. Uh, and then also two internet buttons. Um, but these are little pockets, so you can put stuff in them. And as I said before, this is a battery case, um, so you can put 5 volt batteries in there to power everything. Okay, and basically I want to make a, an enclosure to match that. So, the other value that I need is the one for the belt loops. And since my other battery pack I know doesn't have the right dimensions, I'm going to measure them off of here. I could look at my other model, but I'm lazy. So let's see. The problem I had before is that I think I didn't measure this correctly, actually. So let's see. That's about 32 millimeters long by three and a half millimeters tall. Let's write that down, actually. 32 by 3.5 is that. Okay. Now, where did I go wrong here? 
Oh, yeah, I can use the special internal thing. 31 millimeters. Oh, you fool. <laughs> oh, use the tip here. And 4.7 mil. So it was thick enough, it just wasn't um, tall enough. So if I want a 32 millimeter thing to pass through here, I probably want to make it 33 millimeters at least. What did I do here? Probably 35? Yeah. So I'm using the internal measurement tool. Uh, 36. Cool. And what? I might as well make it match everything else. So I'll make it 36 millimeters by 4.3 millimeters, which is an odd value, but OK. Oh, you know what? I bet it's 4.5 millimeters. I bet I gave myself one millimeter of, um, of wiggle room. Yeah, that makes sense. OK. So into this design, I need to incorporate that belt loop. And let's try and make it kind of a cool shape, too. Like all of these are these kind of crystalline cutoff shapes. And it'd be cool to make it match those. So how about like a? A triangle thing, or like a some sort of hexagon or octagon. I'll figure it out. We'll look at what's available in Tinkercad. Um, so basically, the end diameter or dimensions here are going to be 16 millimeter or 20 millimeters tall. Okay, so there needs to be 16 millimeters of wiggle room, and then we've got a a belt loop that is about 4.6 millimeters tall. And there needs to be space in between those. Oh, don't be there. Depends on how I want this to work. I'm going to say for a minute that I don't want there to be space in between, which means that I can just have holes in the side of it here that the belt passes through with no dividing thing. So let's say that this is. 36, and that's about half the width of the assembly as a whole. And then I want it to be, say, 4.6 tall millimeters, that coupled with the 17 millimeters with space for, you know, wiggle room. And then we also want 1.5. And to make this durable, I probably want to make it two millimeters thick uh, where the belt loop goes through. So let's see, we're looking at 1.5 plus 2 is 3.5 plus uh, 4. Point, let's say 4.5 equals 8 plus 17 equals 25. Cool, so 25 millimeters tall by 70 around. That looks like a good starting point. And for now, I'm not going to care about the buttons. And then it also needs to have this hole in it. So I'm going to decide that the hole should be perpendicular to the uh, belt loop because I want it to stick up so that there will be vertical wires going between the uh, particle and the, the battery packs. And so this is going to need to be um, 14 deep by 20 long. And also, or 21. It also needs to have some vertical uh, size as well. And how deep does that need to be? Let's find out. It's going to be pretty much from the surface of the uh, internet button up to the top of the USB cable. Or no, up to the top of here, because um, that's where the enclosure starts. And then a little bit extra for the depth of the enclosure itself. So that's 1.5 millimeters plus about 5 millimeters. Let's make it 6 and a half. Just for fun, because I want to make sure that it fits. OK, so six and a half. Let's open this up for Q&A. Um, in the meantime, 
So let's go into Tinkerpad and start to make this thing. I'm actually going to make a cylinder first in the proper dimensions and then scale the hexagon around it. You can also, of course, use um, math to figure out how exactly how big it should be. You can hold shift to make it um, have the same like equal dimensions. Use these little boxes to change the height. Use the arrows to move stuff. So, for example, up and down is using the little z-axis holder here. Um, but this changes the height. Likewise, if you just drag it around, it moves horizontally. But you use these little boxes to change the width. So this is going to be the template. Um, how high is it right now? 17 millimeters. Let's just bump it to 20. Or wait, no, we decided that it's going to be 25 tall. So I'll make it a little taller just so that it sticks out of the hexagon. Now the hexagonal prism, I'm going to make it roughly the right size, say like probably 75 or something. Intersect the two. And basically I want to make sure that all of that round area is encapsulated within the hexagon. As you can see, it can be kind of tough to get a, a completely top-down view. However, if I make this into a hole, it becomes transparent. Ha ha! So let's move this around. In Fusion, you can do a similar thing um, by changing the materials that your object is made of. You can turn it into glass. And that's really useful for doing enclosures to make sure that you're encapsulating everything and not rubbing up against bad places. I usually make a, a really simple model of the thing that I'm going to be enclosing. Now, this has got a little bit of overlap still, so let's make it one bigger. Whoa, why don't we have even dimensions here? Oh, because it's a hexagon. Of course, it's going to be wider than it is taller, right? vice versa. So let's see. One more little tweak, and we should be good. Wait, unless is there oh, the wiggle room over there? Let's just move it. Boop. Is that good? Cool. I have verified now that this is big enough. Um, I'm going to keep that cylinder around, actually, because what I'm going to be doing is using it as a hole. So I do want to center these. This is where using something slightly more advanced is nice, because you can make really precise movements and really precise shape your things. But in this case, it doesn't matter that much. Uh, of course, I want to make it a little bit extra big so that we get the full um, sizing for the external part of the shell. Because everywhere that it's touching right now, I need it to actually have some extra thickness. Let's see. That ah, looks about good. That should be fine. It doesn't have to be super precise. This is not a professional thing. Really. It's just for a fun pet project. OK, so now this can go down to 25 millimeters tall. Maybe I'll construct it upside down. and. Just have this. Okay, cool. So can I turn that into an object again? Turn this into a hole. <clears throat> I won't group these until when I'm. In, you know what? Actually, nothing else is going to be projecting into there. I'm going to group this now so that it is very clearly a single object. Oh, right. <laughs> Good to remember. I want to move this up a couple millimeters. Let's say to to get a nice big top shell there. OK, now we group them. Fantastic. And I want to change the color of this because it's kind of ugly. Great. So here we are. We've got this fabulous hexagon. I want to start putting holes in it. So the two sets of holes that I'm going to make are the belt loop and the uh, little place where the, uh, where the USB cable comes in. Now, I get to pick, since this is a hexagon, and there are things that are perpendicular to each other, one of them is going to be on a flat side, and one of them is going to be on a pointy side. 
Um, I think I want the flat side to be up and down. Oh, do I? Yes. Whoa. Big decisions. Yeah. Okay, so the USB cable is going to go on a flat side, and the belt loop is going to go through a sideways one. Okay. So I want to make a box for the belt loop. I'm going to make it arbitrarily long because it's going to stick through both sides of the hexagon. Cool. And then these dimensions, I want to make them like 36 long, 35, and 36. Grr. Trackpads, not the greatest for this. Use a mouse if you can. Okay. Also, obviously, um, a mouse can come in really handy if you have extra buttons. Lots of programs use those for things like, um, you know, instead of selecting a thing or moving it, do orbit mode, view mode. Um, you can toggle between modes really easily. Um, but in this case, I've just got a trackpad. So this is. 25 millimeters, which means this needs to go up to a height of 23 millimeters. That looks kind of wonky right now. Oh, it's measuring from the bottom. Right, because the bottom was sitting on the ground, and that's a zero. And the whole thing is 4 millimeters tall, so 25 minus 4 is 21. And that should put them flush. Cool. And then two more done. 19 millimeters. So that's 19 millimeters off the ground plus four more um, to the top of this thing makes 23, which is perfect. It's two less than 25. Now let's move this in here. Ooh, this is the wrong way around. Okay. So I'm going to sort of center it. Doesn't really matter because basically, so it's 36 by whatever. Um, I'm going to make it whatever by 36. And that actually looks pretty well centered. Again, it doesn't have to be totally perfect. Now, do I want it to be centered or do I want it to sort of hang down? I want it to be centered. It'll be good. So now this is going to turn into a whole. And group it with the hexagon, and oops, <laughs> wrong way around. Okay, and the group, and change the color again because it's hideous. There we go. Belt loops, fantastic. Now when I print this, there is no way to get around this. We need support material because with a hole like this, this stuff would be floating in space. It needs to have stuff printed in here. So that's something to do when I get to the slicer phase. Now the final thing that we need to do here, we could add a cool uh, design on it. Um, in fact, you can import an SVG, and uh, so like a, a vector design, and uh, basically extrude it onto the surface of this thing. We're not going to do that right now because it's a pain. <laughs> I don't have a design to put on here yet. But let's see. So let's do the USB projection bit, make another box. This time we want it to be about 14 by 21. And it's going to intersect about 6.5, let's make it seven millimeters, which means it needs to be that tall. Um, I could make it arbitrarily big and then just try and intersect it the right number of millimeters, but it's going to be a lot easier if I just you know, make it the right size. In fact, you know what I could have done earlier is just use the rotation. Instead of resizing that whole block, um, just like this. Now I'm going to move it so it intersects. Um, Fortunately, this is all kind of centered right now, so I can just, just make it intersect perfectly. 
Make sure that looks good. Oh, no, it needs to come this way a little. Cool, that looks like it is right at the edge. So I'm gonna turn it into a hole and see what happens. If we group these. Not quite. Close, but not quite. Okay. In that case, I'm just going to give myself a little extra room by making it bigger. Wee! It doesn't matter. Still needs to be 14 though. It doesn't matter how long it is because it's just going to project out of there. So now let's group these again. And there we have a very simple enclosure for this internet button. Now, if I want, I can um, make additional holes that will show, for example, the LEDs. The whole point of this, um, besides the buttons made, is to use it as a light source. And, um, you know, on the one hand, I could just make it shine through two millimeters of surface because these are really bright. Um, but at the same time, I want to be able to do color patterns. So I want to have probably holes around the edge that allow these LEDs to show through. I'm printing all this stuff out of blue PLA, so I want to make sure that I can do other colors and it won't look weird. Um, so I want to make holes for those. That's a step for another day. <laughs> you can use math to figure out where they go. It's easy. Although with Fusion, it's going to be a lot easier to place them where you want. Um, and then I'll just print it. And so hopefully next week, I will have a functional folder for this. And I'll be able to wear it and show it off to you all. Um, it's using the accelerometer also that's built into the uh, particle button itself, internet button. And maybe I'll load it up with some example code. Oh, another thing you can do. So since this is going to be, uh, the LEDs can be really bright, with NeoPixels, you can change their brightness. So when I'm doing a wearable, I usually run NeoPixels about 25% brightness, because then people can see the pretty colors, but it doesn't blind them. So that has been today's virtual workshop. Hopefully now you have a vague idea of how to get started with CAD. If you want to make some sweet knuckle rings, um, basically like, it says Hackster, or, oh, or anything with like four letters, you can make into a really sweet uh, knuckle ring that like, goes across here, like a lie for whatever. And I've got a tutorial for that that I'll link in this video. And in the meantime, uh, join us next week. We're going to have a sweet interview for you on Tuesday at 10.30 AM. Don't remember who that is, but I will let you know. And then another virtual workshop on Thursday, 10.30 AM Pacific time. Thank you for watching. I really hope you learned a thing. And catch you next time.